If you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6 will begin uh, the middle chapter of Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. And a little kind of orientation as we read um, this morning, uh, we're going to be handling uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, a little unusually. Uh, I'm going to handle verses 7 through 15 next, next time I preach. Uh, I'll be away in New Orleans next week, and Pastor Jeff will preach for us. But the next time I come back to preach, we'll handle the Lord's Prayer, which is in the middle of this section at that time. But I think you'll notice why we're going to handle everything else together, because there's this repeating pattern three times over in this passage of what we should think about when we pray, when we give, and when we fast. The Lord's Prayer is kind of a a little inclusion, a little parentheses on going, expanding out on what it should look like when we pray. But there's this three three illustrations, really, of what it looks like not to practice your righteousness before men, but rather to practice your righteousness in secret before God. And we'll see that as Jesus handles giving and praying and fasting. So let me read to you uh, Matthew chapter 6. Verses 1 through 18. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do, in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your home, your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows that you, what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. Father, we come before you and we ask you that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit the lessons that you taught in this powerful sermon would forever be sealed on the hearts of this church and would characterize every last individual life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage we're looking at begins with a warning that every Christian needs. It's right there in the very first word of the passage. Beware. It could almost be translated 
be alert, be awake, be sensitive and focused on the reality that there are dangers in the Christian life. And it's kind of an interesting way to begin this section, chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Because up until now, uh, we've had a pretty positive view of what a Christian is. We've been told that a Christian is someone who is cultivating a purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. The Christian hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Uh, The Christian is someone who's merciful. When, When God makes anyone a Christian, he takes out the heart of stone that's in every single human heart when they're born, and he puts in a heart of flesh that's sensitive to the things of God. It's wonderful. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And even in spite of all of this newness, we need to recognize that that doesn't mean that the Christian life is danger-free. You're not so good that you can just coast. You're not so transformed that you can just set your Christian life on autopilot and trust that everything will work out. Every Christian has what the Apostle Paul would describe as the remnants of the old self in the flesh. We still have evil desires. We are new. We want things we didn't want before. Those things will win out. Those are the newest and truest and deepest you. But it doesn't change the fact that there are real dangers in every Christian life. That's why Jesus, who's our shepherd, who tells us how to navigate the dangers, starts by saying, beware, watch out. And what's interesting is that he tells us to watch out for something that we tend to think we don't need to watch out for. I mean, most of us, If we were regularly praying and giving and fasting, we'd be ready to spike the football in the end zone. We'd be ready to say, we're doing it. We're killing it. I'm, whoa, how's your Christian life going? Well, I don't want to say too much, but you know, I've been fasting regularly. Every morning at 7 a.m., there I am, wide awake, bright eyed and bushy tailed, reading that Bible, constant just glory. In everything I read, and I've been giving, I got a raise last year, and I just immediately cut off the top and have been giving. And even if you didn't say that to anyone else, there would be a sense in which we might think, there it is, I'm doing it, finally, I'm walking with Jesus, I'm doing all the right stuff, things are going well. And Jesus says, that's where you need to watch out. That, that area, these areas of the spiritual life, are actually areas where we need to be careful. And this actually affects two very different groups of Christians. I I think it might be good just to think about this for a second. There's Christians like me who got saved out of a secular background or an atheistic background or really godless background, a, a, a background where I wasn't trying to pray or fast or give. And then you get saved and you're like, hey, good, I'm not sleeping around, I'm not stealing, I'm not lying, I'm praying, I'm fasting, things are good. And all of a sudden you realize, whoa, there's actually temptations that the Christian faces while seeking to life, live a life of holiness. We thought that the Christian life was going to be the exit from every sin. And then you find out that actually the Christian life introduces you to a few more possible areas to sin. You can actually sin in your praying. You can sin in your giving. You can sin in your fasting. And the other group, I think, that really needs to pay attention to this particular warning is those of you who are raised in the church, which is always the vast majority of those in the church because God is so faithful generation after generation. It actually blew my mind when I first became a pastor. I had had this radical conversion. I got saved out of complete godlessness. I kept doing, I kept doing membership interviews and I kept hearing the same story after the same story. Well, my parents took me to church and I heard the Sunday school lesson and I gave my life to Jesus. And it kept happening. Almost like the most effective evangelists in the world with this un 
heard of mass called the local church, moms and dads, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders. But to people like many of us, some of you 16, 17 years old, just coming of age, having grown up in the church, some of you 25, some of you 55, you've been praying and giving. The first financial lesson you ever had was you take the first 10% and you put it in a jar. You've been doing those things since before you can remember. And you need to be careful. You need to be really careful. Because you can pray when you're asked to pray. You can give when you get a paycheck. You may even fast with the church, but if someone gets on your playlist on Spotify, it is filth. If someone sees the kind of humor you use with your friends, it is not wholesome talk. If someone were to dig in to the history on your web browser and see the pornography. Oh, oh, if you're asked to pray, you can do it. You got it. If you're asked to lead out in anything spiritual, you can do it second nature. You've been doing it since you're five years old. But there are many people who will go to hell from the pew. There are many people who have learned how to put on the externals of religion second nature to them, but their inner heart, the inner delights of their soul are not with God. They're not with God. And Jesus is saying, watch out, beware. I'm looking for reality here. I'm looking for a true relationship with every single person I call. And I want you to be aware that you can do the externals but if your heart is not internally given to God in secret, you have nothing. Amen. And so he says, beware. And the warning he gives, we need to be very precise about what the warning is. The warning is beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. You gotta read the whole verse. And here's why you got to read the whole verse, because if you were just to read, beware of practicing your righteousness before people, and we said, hey, next Saturday, the elders are calling a day of fasting, and we're like, oh boy. Or, or, you know, you'd be like waiting till everyone left the building before you slipped your money in the envelope, because no one can see, or in the, in the drop box here on the sides of the build, in the sides of the auditorium. We can get the sense that no one can see any of my righteousness. Good luck with that. Righteousness has a very public component. I mean, I'd have to preach alone. <laughs> There's a very public component to our righteousness. And what Jesus is warning us about is not any kind of fasting in public. In Acts chapter 13, remember, the elders were gathered fasting and praying together. They apparently all knew the other guys were fasting. As we go on to Matthew chapter 11, we'll see Jesus and John 17 praying out loud in front of people. The danger is not being righteous in front of other people. The danger is being righteous for other people. And that's what the passage actually says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people to be seen by them. The temptation that enters into every Christian soul is that once God has made our hearts wake up to the reality that he's real and that he's got our whole being and we exist for him, the danger is that after that's happened, we subtly shift to checking out what other people think of our godliness and actually living consumed by what other people think of our godliness. Why is that? This is actually why churches can just be tremendous places of bondage for so many Christians. And it's because those Christians are oriented towards what do these people think of me? 
Unless the, unless the church just provides really strict guidelines, we all do it like this all the time. We're just lemmings for Jesus, and everyone conforms so they can all feel in this sort of mutual admiration society that they're doing it right. This creates this crushing atmosphere. But the church is actually a gathering, not of people who are checking each other out or coming to be checked out. The church is actually a gathering of people who are living for the unseen God. The church is actually a gathering of people who are living for the one who can't be seen. And we're to beware of doing our righteousness for other people in order to be seen by them. And Jesus, now it's real nice, I couldn't think of a lot of illustrations this week, which is okay because Jesus has three illustrations. And they're quite good. The first comes to us in verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, these guys were something, man. Sound no trumpet as, you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Now, I don't know if this is literally what happened or if Jesus is just a really good preacher, but everybody got the point, okay? Bom, 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 bom. You know, like they were just, look, Captain Giver is coming. He will be placing a special brick with his name on it at the corner of the synagogue. He'd like everyone to notice just how generous he is. He's quite, he's quite proud of his humility and would like to put it on display this morning. Same thing with prayer. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, the actors. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners. Now the common Jewish... Uh, posture for prayer was standing hands out raised, but these guys kind of did a little bit more like this. They, they, they positioned themselves so that the center of their prayer was not God, but themselves. They were prostituting prayer, as one person put it. And then, of course, they could be very joyful when they gave, bum, 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 bum happy when they prayed, look at me. And then they knew how to put on a frown like anybody. They knew how to, they, they, mean, they had a little more in their repertoire than they're given credit for. They could play it up, they could play it down. And we're told in verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Can you just imagine this guy? Sort of an Eeyore look, puddle glum on their face. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen like others. And there's just this like dopamine release in the soul. Look, they're fasting. Did you see them? They're fasting. I think they're talking about my fasting. And so it's just, and, and they're living off of the eyes of men. And listen, when you have a God who is often silent, Right? How long, O oh Lord, how long must I go on wrestling with my thoughts? There are times where God feels, isn't, but feels absent. And when that is a reoccurring experience of many believers, you could see how you might be tempted to switch out, waiting in desperation for God, for the quick fix of other people being entranced by your godliness. That's the warning every Christian needs. It's easier to look virtuous than to be virtuous. It's easier to grow a beard and work out than actually be a man. It's easier to put your devotions on Instagram than it is just to sit quietly in front of your Bible waiting for God. That's the warning every Christian needs. The second thing this passage brings to our attention is a consequence every Christian fears. A consequence every Christian fears. 
You see it there in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. No reward. The Bible portrays the glory of being welcomed into heaven as a reward given to the saints, which is just mind-blowing when you think about the fact that we are saved even though we don't deserve it, and then we're empowered to do good works even though we're not inclined to them naturally, and we're, they're planned for us by the living God, and then once we do them, you know what he does? He goes, way to go, and rewards us. It's unbelievable, unbelievable grace. If you never rise above religion for the eyes of man, you will have none of that reward. It, it ultimately means you, you will not be in heaven. You will not be saved. God does not take people who are living for the world through their whole lives and then bring them to the place where he's the center of everything. Now that's good for God because he wants heaven holy. It's not good for you, but it certainly makes sense because you would be miserable in heaven if your deepest longings are for the approval of other people. Because heaven is all about God. It's all about his glory. It's all about his presence. And so Jesus is warning us here, listen, this is not a big thing. I'm not just talking about a growth step in your Christian life. I'm talking about sin, you need to weed out, you need to gouge out, you need to cut off your hand, you need to do whatever it takes to get over this sin, you need to not live for the eyes of people, you need to live for the eyes of God. If you don't, you will not come into a heavenly reward. We're talking about the true perseverance of the saints. Now, many people have an idea, once saved, always saved. I believed at this crusade, I believed at this church, I believed in this Sunday school, and since I believe, I'm good to go. Listen, the only indication you have that you were truly saved when that moment you believed is if you keep growing throughout your Christian life. Not perfectly, but truly, with a consistency. He always carries out the work he begins in anyone he saves. Now, it doesn't, it can be ugly sometimes. It may mean there's much repentance of sin coming out of seasons of backsliding. I'm not, I'm not saying if you haven't had a perfect life, you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that when God creates something, it always grows. When God makes something, it always lives. When God transforms something, it is always transformed. And so here the Lord Jesus is saying, if you practice your righteousness before men, that's just what you live for. How do they like my fasting? How do they like my praying? How do they like my giving? If that's what you're living for, no reward. No heaven. No eternal life. And I've told you this story before, but it, it made such an impression on me. I'll tell it to you again. I was in Minneapolis years ago attending the Bethlehem Conference for Pastors and we got snowed in to Minneapolis for an extra day and so I got to go to Bethlehem Baptist Church where John Piper was the pastor at the time and uh, Francis Chan was uh, preaching that particular Wednesday and he was talking about deceiving others with your faith, convincing other people you're saved. And he said, what reward do you get on the first day in hell where there you are in torment saying to yourself, at least they all think I'm in heaven? Cold comfort. Cold comfort. The only person that matters when it comes to knowing you're saved is God. God because he's the one who saves. And so we need to take it with a deathly seriousness. If, if we're the kind of people who grew up in church and we're, we can pray, we can sort of play the game, we dress one way at church, we dress another way when we're not at church. You know, like we, we're living a double life, we're cultivating a double life. You're only fooling yourself. God is not fooled at all. 
And the end of this sermon, the second to last story of this sermon, is people coming to Jesus on the last day and saying to him, Lord, Lord, we did mighty works in your name. Like, we're the real deal. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. You lawless ones, you didn't obey me. You didn't finally submit to me. Oh yeah, yeah, you did enough submission to convince others, but you, when no one was around, in secret, were not submitted to me. Depart from me, I never knew you. So this warning that every Christian needs, this warning we're going through, is Jesus saying, I really want you in heaven. I really want you there. I really want you saved. I really want you to know my salvation, but I'm not playing games. I'm not just going to save you while you love everything but me. My salvation is going to bring you to bowing your knee before me, calling out to me for salvation, and then watching me change you as you lean on me for all of that change. So there's a warning every Christian needs, a consequence every Christian fears. No Christian wants to miss out on the reward. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Every Christian reads that, they go, that's what I want. I, I, I've, I've seen the signposts and the appetizers down here on earth. I've seen the echoes of God in the sun and the moon and the music and marriages and everything beautiful in the world. They're all echoes and signposts and appetizers of God. I've seen it, I've tasted it, but I want the main course. I want to see God. And so Jesus is coming along and saying, if you go down this path, you'll miss the reward. If you're a true Christian, there's a, there's a recoil. I don't wanna miss out on God. I'd rather miss out on everything in this world than miss out on God. I'd rather be regarded as a fool. I'd rather be regarded as someone missing out on every good thing than miss out on Jesus. That's the consequence every Christian fears. Third point, the secrecy every Christian must cultivate. The secrecy every Christian must cultivate. Listen to this from the words of the Lord Jesus. Verse three. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Secret. Most Christian giving should be secret. Now, do we have to give in public sometimes? Absolutely. And you see in Acts chapter 2 and 4, people bringing money to the apostles' feet. That's where the money needed to go. But when Ananias and Sapphira did it, just so people were be noticing them, God drops them dead. So he says, let your giving be in secret. And then I love this. The father who sees in secret will reward you. You know what? I don't know how much any of you give. But God does. And I do know this. If you give significantly, there's a sacrifice. I know that. There are things you can't do because you've given so sacrificially. I know that. And it might feel like no one understands that. No one understands what you have sacrificed. You could be in a different house. You could do that renovation this year, not next year. Your kid could be on this team, not that team. If you, if you didn't give quite so much, I don't know. Those are, those are real costs. Those are real burdens. I don't know what you give, but God does. He sees it. He rejoices in it. He sees it in secret. He knows that your heart is given to his kingdom. He knows that your heart is laying up treasures in heaven. And that's precious to him. And when you pray, verse 6, go into your room and shut the door. And don't take your camera with you so you can take a picture of it. And post it on social media. 
When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. The location of God. Interesting, isn't it? People, I want to meet with God. I want to know God. I want to be in God's presence. How much time do you carve to be where no one else can see you? Where's God? In secret. Now listen, when any of us get in secret, it's not pretty, is it? No, it's not. There's fights against fatigue, fights against discouragement, fights against keeping your thoughts straight, fights against de the devil, fights against doubt. There you are, fighting a battle that's the most intense battle a human being can ever fight, and you're not getting, and there, no one's going to give you a purple heart. You're not going to get any special recognition. You aren't going to get prayer warrior of the month in this week's bulletin. But there's someone who's noticing every bit of it. He loves, you say, my prayers are so broken. Well, he doesn't despise a bruised reed, a smoldering flax. He, 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 we, I don't even know what to pray. That just draws him near, not far away. If you don't know what to pray, the Spirit comes and helps us in our weakness with groanings too deep to even comprehend. So getting, there's nothing glorious about this. It's not like there ought to be fireworks going off when you pray. No soundtrack. No nothing. Just a broken, dying, decomposing sinner. Saved by grace, calling out to their father. And he's, he's watching the whole thing. And this is his favorite thing. Jesus is saying, you want to practice righteousness? It doesn't start with anything public. It starts in secret. And it doesn't just start in secret. This is the way it continues your whole Christian life, is the best parts of you are the parts no one sees, except the one that matters. He sees in secret. Verse 17, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. So you're going to have to go out that day when you're fasting. What's the number one priority? Look good. Wipe your face off. Make it look, make it shine. Make it look like you just had a steak, some potatoes and some, some green beans. Like you're, you're doing well. Insert your favorite meal here. Don't go out looking like you're fasting. But no one will know. And I wanted to encourage the body. They're going to be okay. <laughs> this, this impulse is deep. I, I, I caught myself just the other day. I was reading my Bible in my living room. Not my normal place for reading it. I was, it was early in the morning. No one was awake. I was reading my Bible. Had it on my lap. And then I got distracted by my phone. Did what I tell you not to do, what I try not to do. But there it was. Grabbed my phone. I don't know what I was looking at, but it, it wasn't any verse. And... <laughs> And then I heard a kid come downstairs. Just put my phone under my leg. I want to be the dad with my Bible. And I was studying for this passage. And so we got to put it to death. You got to put it to death. Listen, what do my kids need more? To, uh, for me to appear like a dad who reads the Bible? or to be a dad who reads the Bible? Do your kids need to think you pray for them? Or do you need to pray for them? Now, what, they, they, it sounds so close. What's the difference? The one is just a psychological impression on those around you. The other is the activation of the power of the living God. Asking him to move. What is the greatest need of the church? God. It's the power of God. It's for God to move, for God to act. 
That is the greatest need. Listen to me, Emmanuel. This was the, I kept thinking of this line back from my uh, left-wing political days, and I found the, the origin of this line in a line in a civil rights song. The, 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 the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. What does that mean? The biggest change, the biggest upheaval, the, the most revolutionary thing you can imagine will not make it onto TikTok, will not make it into Instagram, will not make it onto TV, will not make it into the newspaper. It will be unseen. Oh boy, that's true in the church. If we were to get a hold of this teaching, if we were to live this teaching, guess how much we would know about it by next week? Nothing. It wouldn't be in the newspaper. It wouldn't be any of the group me's or WhatsApp's. It wouldn't be in the announcements. It would just be you finding a closet and shutting the door. And that is the most significant need of this church in this time and at all times. That is the most significant need of your life. What the main thing, if you want to talk about what do I need to do in the Christian life? Uh oh, he's talking about doing. Okay, okay, let me just go back for a second. It all depends on what Jesus has done. Jesus did it all, he saved you. Now you need to do some things. Not to be saved, but because his salvation is actually powerful. The most significant thing that needs to be done at Emmanuel Baptist Church is for all of us to get alone where no one sees. Give generously, pray generously, and fast with actual mourning. Not that people see, but that God sees. Fourth point, the reward that every Christian desires. So what have we seen so far? There's a warning every Christian needs. Hey, I'm not above this. I'm not above using the prayer and the fasting and the giving that God's commanded me for me. I'm not above that. I'm not exempt from that. It's a warning every Christian needs. There's a consequence every Christian fears. You don't want to just get people to give you attaboys for your spiritual life. It's hollow. And I didn't even emphasize it, but what did the passage keep saying? They have received their reward. They have received their reward. That's it. When they get the, oh man, John, you're real spiritual. Bill, you're really living for Jesus. That's it. That's all you get. End of story. You're paid out in full. When you die, it's downhill from there. The answer to that is not a preoccupation with, did I sound like I wasn't trying to impress people? Good luck with that one. That was a bit bold. I'll have to tone it down next. That was a touch too toned down. And you become a connoisseur of your own spiritual sounds. No, the answer for your temptation and mine to impress other people is to actually cultivate something real and secret. Then when you're in front of people, you'll actually talk to God like you talk to God. S the secrecy. But when that, cult that secrecy is cultivated, it brings a reward every Christian desires. You see that? Verse four. So that your giving may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret, will reward you. I'm not being crass to say giving pays off. He will reward you. It literally means this idea, it's got an idea of repayment. He will reward you. Verse eight, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret and your father is in secret, see your secret and he will reward you. Verse 18, your fasting may not be seen by others, but your father is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. It, all, it pays. It pays to fast and to give and to pray. But what does it pay? What's the payoff? 
What's the reward? Well, I'll put it to you in two categories. The one's more important than the other, but I'll put it to you in two categories. The first reward is heaven. The first reward is heaven. And I think it's interesting that with these commands, Jesus wants to get into the life of every Christian and he says, I want you so alone with me that what's cultivated is the two things that are absent from every soul. An actual Godwardness and an actual otherworldliness. I want you alone with me long enough that you want me for me and you want me for heaven. That you're not living for this world. Back in Matthew chapter 5, when it was talking about persecution, it says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great if you're persecuted. Your reward in heaven is also great if you pray and you give and you fast. What's the reward? Oh, heaven comes, Jesus comes at it with so many images, crowns, street of gold, room in my home. I don't know, take everything good in life, take out the bad, turn it up to 10, you're getting close. And then infuse it all with Jesus' presence instead of his absence. He's immediate presence. Boy, these days in Louisville, we feel the sun, don't we? The other day I was sitting outside. I've been to Indonesia, Indonesia a number of times. I was thinking, Indonesia's got nothing on Louisville. This is hot. That sun is beating down on me. And in heaven, the sun is going to be the Lord Jesus, warming our souls. Just perfect warmth, perfect heat, perfect glory. But the other reward here on earth is that the natural product of actually getting alone with God for what you're getting along with, alone with God for. Let me explain what I mean, then I'm gonna sit down. These hypocrites, they're doing religion to get other people to look at them. See me pray, see me give, see me fast. The Christians getting alone in secret where no one can see them so they can actually mourn over their sins and experience his forgiveness. You will be rewarded. The, the Christian is getting alone with God to pray so they can actually pray, hallowed be your name. I am convinced that the victory over every sin is bottled up in the answer to that prayer. If you knew God's name as Father, more reverently residing in your heart, then I tell you what, porn and lying and anxiety would have nothing on you. God is my Father. And I can be alone where no one else is telling me anything, asking him to make his name hallowed in my heart. And I'm growing in this reverence for him. So the reward of prayer is the answer to the prayer. It's not something artificial. I'm praying so I can look like I'm praying so you can adore me. That's, that's all fake. It's your heavenly father who sees you in secret. What, 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 there you are in secret doing what? Saying your kingdom come. What's the reward? The kingdom comes. Okay? You're there in secret going, Lord, my daily bread. What's the reward? Breakfast. There's a direct relationship. What's the reward when you give? Well, the person's actually helped. There's all these TikTok reels, I'm told, where people go around giving money to the poor. But the poor become a prop in your personal play rather than real people who need your aid. What's the reward when you give to the needy? They actually get help. And no one knows about it. No one writes a book about you. That's fine. You don't get your... Man, TikTok is really cheating us. Andy Warhol had 15 minutes of fame. Now you get 15 seconds of fame. Or 
You can be recorded with all your good deeds in the eyes of the Lord who dwells in secret. So the reward is heaven itself and then all of the good fruit from the good deeds we seek the Lord for. And guess what? Your Christian life becomes less and less an anxious flittering about of what you can do on your job, your family, and more a daily waiting on what he can do. Because there you were in secret saying it to him again, I can't do it, the floods are too big, the waves are too high, but you can. And the God who's secret says, oh, you know, I'm in secret, I'm kind of incompetent, kind of inept. No, no, no. Once he's been honored in that secret place, he loves to flex publicly. He loves to reward with those answers to his people. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you want us alone with you. Or we were offensive to you, we're enemies of yours, and that you would want us so alone, so bare before you is just a testament to Christ's reconciling work. And we pray, Lord God, that you would find us alone with you more and more in the coming days. That the darkness, the doubt, the discouragement, the distraction, our minds can only last five seconds sometimes. That none of that would keep us away from you. That we would rather endure days and weeks of longing and wanting alone with you than to be out in the world satisfied. And then, Lord, I pray you'd give us many times of sweetness in the secret place, glory in the secret place. And, Lord, I pray that Emmanuel Baptist Church and all the churches that love your gospel would become places where everything happening, we could say, that's just the reward of God. That's just God working. We don't see all the engine work happening in secret, but we see the fruit. And Lord, we can't wait to heaven where all that secret work that's unnoticed will be rewarded by you with your great, well done, my good and faithful servant. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.